I am Kelly Leginiger. I'm an MS Sustainability st Study student from Lenore, Ryan, and Asheville. Um, I'm actually remote. I'm speaking to you from Columbus, Ohio. Um, the Muscles Project was really interesting. That was cool that I happened to be in Ohio as well. Um, I'm also a Reese Fellow and have had the pleasure to come visit Asheville earlier this season and get to see some of the project sites we discussed in the following presentation. Um, thanks to everyone for getting here on time. Um, for the presenters, we're going to start with Renee. Uh, Renee Fortner from Water is the, excuse me from Riverlink is the Water Resources Manager. Um, she grew up along the New River in Ash County, North Carolina. Uh, where she spent most of her childhood exploring the woods in the creek near her home. Her childhood experiences instilled an unwavering love of the outdoors and a passion for conservation. Renee's interests eventually led her to Asheville, where she pursued a bachelor's degree in biology from UNC Asheville, and later an MS in biology from East Carolina University. Renee holds professional certificates in stormwater BMP inspection and maintenance and residential rain garden design from NC State University. She is also a board of trustee for the Friends of Hominy Creek Greenway. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, was that correct, Renee? Did I get that? All right, great. Thanks, Eddie. I want to make sure I got that. Okay. Um, next, we'll meet Tim. Tim Ormond is the president of Blue Earth and co-founder. He has over 25 years of experience as a civil engineer and project manager, specializing in water resources and environmental engineering with a focus on hydrology, stormwater, excuse me, stormwater management, green infrastructure, floodplain management, and ecological design. Registered professional engineer in North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Massachusetts, and California. Tim holds a BS degree in civil and environmental engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, 1991, and an MS degree in civil and water resources engineering from Texas A&M University in 1993. He has completed extensive coursework in sustainable approaches to stormwater management, rainwater harvesting, and ecological design. Tim is an avid student of ecological design systems and has studied permaculture design for many years. Um, and last but not least, mine and Louisa, who spoke earlier, is professor and our Reese advisor, Dr. Keith McDade. Uh, he is a professor, as I said, of sustainability studies at the Center for Graduate Studies of Asheville. He is a director of the Master of Sciences Sustainability Studies program, which we're a part of, and a director of the Reese Institute for the Conservation of Natural Resources. He's also one of the MCs today. Most of you will recognize him. In 2019, uh, McDade, Dr. Keith received the Raymond Morris Best Distinguished Professor Award given annually to honor a Lenore Ryan faculty member for outstanding teaching and mentorship. He has learned a great amount working with Tim Orman and Renee Fortner over the past few years on this innovative stormwater project. Um, so I will turn things over to Renee, who will kick things off. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kelly. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to present the work the collaborative work that we've been doing. Um, all right. Okay, are you seeing my slides? Yes, but you wanna switch uh, presenter mode because we just see the small slide. Oh, okay. At display settings, of the, or yeah, anyway. Hide presenter view. I think so what does it well, look like now 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 it's i would go to just go back to slideshow yeah that will work sometimes zoom can overwhelm the system yeah and if it doesn't work, we can just okay. Let me the smaller uh, slides. Okay, I'm gonna stop share for for a moment and see if I Absolutely. can. Absolutely, uh... yeah. Looking good. Yes. Yes, you're on your second slide though. Okay. 
Why? This is proving so difficult. I apologize. All right, hold on. I believe it's because I have two screens. Makes sense. Now we're on the map of the French Broad River watershed. Okay. How's this? Are you seeing? We're not seeing anything right now. Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> I am so sorry. We could we could possibly have Andrew share a screen with your presentation. Yeah, I'm working on getting it up. Right okay. Now. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, I'm excited to talk about some collaborative work that we've been doing uh, to restore an urban mountain watershed. And I'm going to talk about the process that we went through to create this watershed restoration plan, which uh, resulted in the uh, project, the innovative stormwater project that Tim and Keith are going to speak to afterwards. Okay. And first, a little bit about Riverlink. Uh, our mission is to promote the environmental and economic vitality of the French Broad River watershed. Next. Uh, this map shows the eight county region in Western North Carolina that comprises the French Broad River watershed. Next. And the central Asheville watershed is really at the heart of the city. Uh, you can see the city of Asheville highlighted on this map in orange and the central Asheville watershed is the area highlighted in red. Okay, next. Uh, the watershed is relatively small, but it includes most of downtown Asheville, the River Arts District and under-resourced communities. And this drainage area flows into a section of the French Broad River that is listed as impaired for bacteria. And uh, there are three streams in this watershed, and you'll hear me talk here shortly about one in particular that locals refer to as Nasty Branch. Okay. Uh, in August of 2020, Riverlink completed the Central Asheville Watershed Restoration Plan uh, in partnership with Blue Earth Engineering. Next. Because we knew that this watershed contained uh, underrepresented communities, we really dove into the demographics of the watershed to help inform our restoration plan. And um, just wanted to highlight that there are several historic African-American communities in this watershed, one in particular, the Southside community, was heavily impacted by the federal urban renewal program in the 1970s. This image on the left shows Nasty Branch and the Southside community that surrounded it in 1951. And in 1975, you can see where um, ultimately there were hundreds of homes and businesses that were built up along the stream that were demolished. These were black owned homes and businesses. Next. And then when we looked at the census data, we could see the lingering effects of the urban renewal on this historic African-American community. There are high rates of poverty and unemployment. Next. And so these watershed demographics really shaped our project goals going into it. So we knew that we really needed to emphasize gathering community input on our plan 
and we needed to consider the impacts of the restoration plan on the underserved communities. Next. Uh, so gathering community input, we went uh, door to door, online surveys, we piggybacked onto community events and we really emphasized listening to residents. Next. Uh, initially, we referred to this as the River Arts District Watershed Restoration Plan, but during these listening sessions, we heard from Black residents in these communities that they did not identify with the River Arts District, um, and that to them it represented gentrification, and they didn't feel welcomed in this particular part of Asheville. So we decided to change the name of the plan to the Central Asheville Watershed to be more inclusive, and we also started referring to um, what officially is called town branch as nasty branch, because historically that's what the community called the stream. Okay, next. And then we built a coalition to implement the plan. Uh, volunteers contributed many hours and we developed a core stakeholder group of community leaders. Next. To connect communities to the watershed, uh, we led a Name That Creek campaign for one of the three streams that previously didn't have a name, and the community voted uh, to name that stream Haith Branch in honor of a prominent um, African-American uh, member of the community. Okay, next. And so the plan was complete. We had 75 projects and initiatives that were proposed to address the impairments in these three streams of the watershed. Okay, next. I'll just briefly highlight one of the projects and then set the stage for Tim's presentation. One of the projects that came out of this effort was the Southside Community Stormwater Project. Um, we The goals of this project were improve, to improve water quality and habitat in Nasty Branch, help address some community needs, and continue to build these community partnerships. Okay, next. Uh, so this project took place at a public housing community known as Erskine Apartments. During the watershed study, we recognized that there were a lot of um, stormwater runoff issues within this community, uh, one of which was negatively impacting a residential parking lot. And so uh, we worked with Wildlands Engineering to propose um, restoring a wetland, daylighting a stream, and then replacing uh, a concrete swale with a regenerative stormwater conveyance. Okay, next. We also um, recognize this as an opportunity to help address some needs within this under-resourced community. And so residents identified some amenities that we um, were able to get grant funding for that uh, we also were able to incorporate into this bigger green stormwater infrastructure project. So things like safe walking paths, um, a shade structure, memorial garden, and edible plants. Okay, next. And so construction was completed this past summer. On the left, you can see the beautiful stormwater wetland. It has a walking path around it, uh, a memorial garden uh, overlooks the wetland. And then on the right, you can see a regenerative stormwater conveyance where the concrete ditch used to be and split rail fence. And there's, you can see the walking trail there on the left. All right. And now I will turn it over to Tim uh, to talk about our DIS in the mountains project. Thank you, Renee. I think the sharing needs to be turned off by Andrew. Okay. May you have better luck sharing your screen than I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wish me luck, everybody. Can everybody see what looks like a PowerPoint? It looks great. Perfect. Cool. Thanks. All right. I'm going to set my timer. Thank you very much, everybody, for this opportunity to share about our innovative stormwater research project. See if the slides change. It did not change yet on our side. Okay. All right. Now it did. Okay, good. Well, this is just some shameless marketing stuff. I'll skip through that. Thank you, Kelly, for the intro outline. I'm going to talk about what is DIS. 
stormwater challenges in the mountains, our research project, the planning, design, construction, monitoring, and next steps. And you're going to see a lot of different information and details, and you're going to hear the word disconnection a lot. But I, what I really like you to think about is connection, because really what this is about, you're going to have to do some mental jujitsu, but we're really talking about connecting natural hydrology. So if when I finish, you, you're thinking, boy, this is all about connection, then I've done a good job. If you think, boy, that was a lot of data and I have no idea what he said, that, then I didn't do a good job. Then we'll end, end with Q&A. So what is DIS? Of course, it is just one more acronym to add to your collection, disconnected impervious surface. And here's the problem. If you look, look here, you see a downspout connected to a driveway and this will flow to either a street, a gutter, a storm sewer. And it may not look like much, but if you had a 1,000 square foot roof with one inch of rain, you've got 600 gallons. If you had 50 inches of rain a year, you're talking 30,000 gallons. And in a small community of 10,000 roofs, you're talking 300 million gallons and, and so on, like the old shampoo commercials. And that's gonna have water quality and flooding impacts downstream. downstream. And so essentially what DIS is, is taking runoff from impervious areas and redirecting it to vegetated pervious areas. It's very simple. And in a lot of communities, they use the term downspout disconnection or rooftop disconnection. I think North Carolina is unique in that we use this wonderful acronym DIS. And it's something that's already approved in our state stormwater manual. It's a very simple practice, low cost. It's done typically at the residential scale. You could do it yourself. There's potential widespread application, and that's why we were very interested in it. But there are some site constraints with DIS. The slopes are limited to 8%. The graphic says 7%, but there's there was a typo in the state manual. <clears throat> and you need sufficient vegetated area for infiltration. So there are obviously limited options in the mountain region because we have slopes greater than 8%. In fact, they're everywhere. Sometimes we have slopes of 50% or more, and we have insufficient vegetated area for infiltration. There's cost concerns, maintenance concerns. People are concerned what, what impacts will happen in their yards. And it's really not a high priority unless you have some existing problem like slope failure, or flooding, erosion, that kind of thing. So a brief history of steep slope stormwater techniques. You may have seen these in National Geographic. These are some um, cases of terraces in the Philippines and in Peru going back 2,000 years, presumably to meet their NPDES permit requirements, and also perhaps to grow rice. You can see them in China and Yemen as well. And... We did a literature review looking at over 20 different criteria manuals, and you don't find a lot of stormwater practices for steep slopes unless you have some kind of uh, major technique or intervention. And this piqued my interest about 10 years ago. So I worked with Madison County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District for an innovative stormwater grant, steep slope bioretention pilot project. And we got a, got a grant to do this. Um, basically, we looked at two different techniques, a gabion, gabion basket wall and a segmental block wall, and built these uh, essentially terraced rain gardens on slopes of about 50%. The project was successful, um, but as you might imagine, the costs are high when you, when you start dealing with retaining walls. So I also came up with this, this lower simple a technique called an infiltration garden. This was also at the Stormwater Education Park in Mars Hill. And essentially, this is just constructing swales and berms on contour. We planted the berms with edible plants like elderberries, and basically it's capturing uh, runoff from the, from the slope. So all of this has been in my back pocket, and this leads us to our, our current project, DIS in the Mountains. And basically, the project had um, some simple goals. 
just oops, condensing the words, managing treating stormwater runoff, coming up with techniques for the mountain region. And then Keith is going to talk to us about the social research. And um, yeah, this is our little bit about the project. Uh, Renee and Riverlink have been our fearless leader. We did kind of the, the lead engineering and consulting and planning, and Keith did the social research. It was really a community effort. We had Wildlands Engineering helping with monitoring primarily. The site selection process, we, we did a GIS evaluation. This is in the central Asheville watershed, sent a mail, mailer to 337 different properties. We got about a 10% response. And then Renee and I got into our low rider, turned up the base, and we did this drive by and checked out all of these different properties. And we had a criteria matrix where we ranked each one of them based on things such as slope, uh, constructability, utilities, visibility, et cetera. And um, we ended up picking the top six sites based on funding availability. And this is where they're kind of distributed throughout the watershed. And the, the range here, so compare this range of 17 to 33% to the state criteria, which is 8%. And in this watershed, there's a lot of older homes. They're smaller lots. Some of the houses are built back in the 20s. Some are a little bit newer than that. Um, but basically, you have small lots that drain from one to another. This is one of the sites that was selected, 33%. This had potential three sites. We picked two of them because of some utility constraints ranging from 20 to 33%. Or yeah, this one had a slope of 19%. This corner lot had an average slope of 28%. There's gonna be a quiz at the end. So please remember all these slopes. Um, this has an average slope of 17%, which was on our low end. And this one here had some existing terraces. We were going to work with, with that, um, but because of budget constraints, we ended up, oops, uh, working with the upper slope, which was 17%. So we did some brainstorming of different uh, designs. Basically, we're looking at simple do-it-yourself type of work terraces, earthworks, berms, swales, basins, bringing back that blast from the past, my infiltration garden. And so <clears throat> looking at different slopes, once you get above about four to one, you start needing more structural interventions like rocks and retaining walls. So these are just some examples on an agricultural property. Um, the water flow is going down the slope and it's intercepted by these berms and swales. And the berms or swales could be, both be planted with, with plants. This is an example of something called the boomerang basin in Australia. Just basically interconnected basins. That brings us to the design. So we're focusing on currently uh, connected downspouts, basically disconnecting the downspouts. And if there's one thing you're going to, to remember from this presentation is this, number two, which is volume-based versus area-based. So the current state criteria is area-based. It's looking for um, a sufficient area that you can uh, redirect your downspout to. But because we we don't have um, that kind of ground in a lot of the mountains, we focused on volume. Our goal was a one and a half inch storm, making sure it fits the landscape. Um, a maximum storage depth of 12 inches, working with PVC risers rather than earthen spillways just to reduce the risk of erosion. And this was a big one too, was uh, using the existing soil, no engineered media. That's to keep the cost down. Native edible landscaping. So this is the big, the big thing, the most important slide I'd say, is the left is what the current criteria is and the right is basically what we did building storage into the slope. This is one of my magic spreadsheets and um, it's basically balancing all of these different parameters so we could get the practice to work and fit. And, um, you know, it's, it's basically a balancing act of how much runoff you can disconnect and how much space is available. 
This was one of our concept designs. This is a swale design. You can see the swales in green and planted with vegetation in circles. And this one here is a basin design. So those are the two primary designs. And then we, we provided these to the property owners just so they could have an idea of what was going to be built on their, their front yards. Um, this just shows some cross sections. Our roof area captured 480 to 1300 square feet. This will also be on the quiz, so take notes. This just shows the schematic of, of the roof areas that were being diverted and where they're being diverted to. And then I'll show you some construction photos, but first I'm gonna show you what was constructed. So a total of eight basins, four swales, the soil was mechanically fluffed, like the, the co our contractor likes to say, um, basically using the teeth of a bucket to go 12 to 18 inches down. Total disconnected area, um, compacted earth and berms, all downspots were piped underground. Total of 900 plug plants, 14 plant varieties, natives being done by volunteers. And we did all of this for a budget on all six sites, including the monitoring and the plantings for 22,000. And you can kind of, I'll show you some construction. In this case here, the property owner had some skill with stonework. So he built this, um, this really nice stone wall to, to frame it. I'm gonna, I know we, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna go through these a little bit quickly. Here you can see some clay soils. This one here is um, what we call the wraparound swale system, or Renee invented that and she's trademarking it. Um, but basically it's on this corner lot. So you can see these, these two interconnected swales. This one here is a three basin system. And we had a two basin system and a one basin system. Uh, one of our, um, Property owners alerted us to this free 3D scanner app for iPhone 12 that we use to characterize all the surfaces, it uses LiDAR. This is a planting plan um, with all these native, native plants trying to get at least three season interest, a lot of pollinator plants. And Riverlink put together these awesome signs with QR codes so anyone who walks by in the neighborhood can connect in and go to the website. That takes us to <clears throat> monitoring. We're finishing up right now our two-year monitoring period. We engaged residents with rain gauges and a smartphone app. Um, our inflow is essentially, basically it's coming off the roof and the outflow. We're using uh, vortex meters. So this is a vortex meter. They're about $100 each. Um, it turns out they weren't capturing the uh, low flows. A few other things, just you know, physical inspection of how these practices are performing over time and getting input from the residents as well. Results so far, we have lots of community interest. The property owners are super happy. Um, the berms are holding up well. The infiltration is high. The vortex meters didn't work out so well because they weren't capturing the, the low flows. So we ended up installing other meters called um, positive displacement meters. The good thing is we only bought one of the vortex meters, so we didn't lose much money. This was our smartphone app that was, was not used as much as we were hoping it would be, but it was there. And here I'll show you what it looks like. One of the property owners took this, this video and you can see the river is, the river, the road is almost like a river but you see his property actually had no uh, outflow at all. It was, everything was captured on site. I'm gonna speed through here quickly. We've had some tours and this is what the, the project is looking like after the vegetation came in. We put in edible plantings and strawberries. And so on the left, you can see the, the left is um, before and the right is after. And this is, one of the systems thriving. Our next steps, we're gonna complete the monitoring and the research report, which I'm working on. 
completing the social research. And the most important part is spreading the DIS information or disinformation. And what I'd like to say is um, don't report me to the authorities, but if you do, I will um, just tell them about the project. We've been making the rounds at different conferences, telling them all about this, this project and having fun doing it, finishing our technical report. You can go to this website to learn more. And what, what I like to say is there's many things I love about living in Asheville. <laughs> and uh, one of them is the, the sense of community. <clears throat> and I found this during the project that apparently we have roving gangs that are marking their territory with positive affirmations. This one says, you matter. So I just wanted to let everybody know that, <laughs> that you matter and DIS matters. Um, so with that, thank you for being DIS interested. And uh, I know we have, we have to make up time, so I'll, I'll stop there. And Thank you, Tim. That was outstanding. And I'm going to uh, move quickly and okay. uh, pick up on the social research. Uh, and uh, I was very lucky to work with both Tim and Renee on this project. And, uh, and I also was lucky to work with Louisa and Kelly, who you've met, as well as uh, as well as some other Reese Fellows. Uh, one of those is Allison Royer, and another one is Kelly Cross, who were active in the early days here, and a whole bunch of other students here. Um, so I'm just getting my presentation set up, and uh, you hear me and see my screen, is that right? Good to go? All right, well, as Tim and Renee said, uh, we worked on the social research. Uh, I'm a social scientist, and uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we used as a, an approach, which is community-based social marketing. Uh, I'll then talk about some of the literature that we borrowed from to build what we built. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our context, but I think Renee captured it really well. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about our methods, um, our interviews, our surveys, um, and then I'll talk about the results of what we learned from these various uh, engagements and insights and considerations. Uh, and then the next and final steps as we're entering uh, the last days of this. So uh, you may or may not have heard of an approach called community-based social marketing, uh, but it is uh, an, an approach that aims to identify barriers and benefits so that communities can begin to transform and take on um, new behaviors. And, and sometimes those are single use behaviors like installing stormwater management practices. Uh, and it, and it's, it runs through these five steps, uh, first selecting behaviors here, they're focused on DIS, but much more broadly, um, other stormwater management practices on private property. Um, we'll talk about how we identified barriers and benefits and then from that, we developed strategies. And in this case, we had both physical strategies and social strategies. And we'll talk about both of those, but the physical ones you just heard about, which were DIS test sites. Uh, and once we learn about what's working and what isn't, uh, then we can implement these on a larger scale. Uh, this was developed by Doug McKenzie Moore, and it's it's wildly popular and uh, and pr produces some pretty great insights. And at the same time, it is an extractive method pulling out of the community, but it's all about putting back into the community as well. Uh, and so, in the many research resources we used, um, one stood out in particular, and uh, that was by Smith and all, and they they did a community-based social marketing approach to stormwater in Waterloo, Ontario, and uh, in their efforts to identify barriers as to why people weren't taking practice take, taking steps on their own property. Uh, cost and lack of knowledge were right at the top of barriers. That's something to remember um, because we'll come back to that. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other studies that we looked at and uh, and a whole bunch of other resources. Uh, and uh, also two years ago at this very conference, uh, Kristen Cockerell did a great presentation on what does the public think about stormwater. Uh, and it, this was just as we were starting this project, we had already done our first survey, but um, she and her colleagues at App State looked at a much larger area than we were looking at from New York to North Carolina in the Appalachian region. Uh, and what she learned is that not only is this very understudied, uh, but also it's very complex and context matters. And so you're going to find different approaches in different places, which is why it's important to get a little bit more focused than this wide region that they looked at. Um, some more 
aspects of our context, um, we were starting this as we were still in a pandemic. We were coming out of the pandemic, but it was still, um, people were a little hesitant to engage in certain kinds of ways. Um, uh, Renee already pointed out the gentrification and rapid development that's happening, uh, and others at this conference have as well. And, and Tim pointed out the steep slopes um, and the climate change. And also during our surveying, Tropical Storm Fred came through and woke a lot of people up as to how bad things could get. Um, and this is our process. So uh, I'm a professor, so I like to bring these things into my classes. Um, we've connected with many classes. Um, the students in Policy 525, Environmental Policy, wrote the first survey and, and conducted all of the first interviews. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Students in another class, uh, Visions of Sustainable Communities, uh, have been researching methods for engaging marginalized communities that can inform the project. Um, students in sustainability, behavior, education, and communication uh, have worked on some uh, education materials that can complement the work that was being done by Riverlink. And we worked with the Reese Institute, with Reese Fellows. Um, we did interviews with uh, key community members in the Central Asheville watershed. Uh, some of them were neighborhood leaders, some of them were church leaders, some of them were uh, respected people within uh, various communities and marginalized communities. Um, and uh, and from that, we were, we were building not only a set of questions to ask for our interviews, for our survey, but also a strategy by which we could engage. Um, and we, what we did was we had two surveys. Um, the first one was in the summer and fall of 2021, and that was focused entirely on the Central Asheville watershed. And then just this past fall, up until yesterday, we had a survey of uh, the greater Asheville area. And we were looking at folks' knowledge, context, perceived barriers and benefits, and what they might be willing to do. And in order to get the survey out, the first one, um, we had these mailers, as you see on the right, uh, and we sent them to every home in the Central Asheville watershed. Um, we also attended, and students in particular, and Reese Fellows attended all the neighborhood meetings and gave out uh, paper flyer, paper surveys there. We placed them in local coffee shops, and Allison did a whole lot of tabling along the river. Um, it was hard during COVID, um, and it was hard to reach diverse communities uh, and, and really to get anyone to take um, even just 10 minutes to take the survey. So we, we had a small sample, 87 surveys for the first one. First one. Uh, and this is who showed up, um, more, more females than males with some other um, fluid trans folks, um, a pretty good mix of ages, um, a pretty good mix of uh, mostly homeowners, but actually a whole bunch of other um, types of dwelling on the right there. Um, we had about 58% white um but the other category uh was a combination of mixed race and and then some other sometimes nonsensical uh, or maybe just difficult to interpret um responses and then we also had sort of uh, we had uh, we we had few smaller populations of hispanic asian and african-american than that we would have liked for this particular survey um and across uh income levels it was pretty widely it was pretty evenly distributed except the the lowest bracket there. Um, and this question stands out. We asked how high of a priority are stormwater issues in the Central Asheville watershed to you? Tim already sort of commented on this, but this group actually does care, um, which if you see, so this is a Likert scale with one being not at all and five being very much, um, that these people care, or at least tend towards caring um, and maybe trying to present themselves socially in a nice way. But I th we thought instead that, um, according to what is diffusion innovation theory that Everett Rogers have, has developed, the, this group is, is probably early adopters. Those who stopped and took the time to answer a survey about stormwater at the end of uh, the COVID period, um, th they were committed to these issues. And so it, it's a particular segment of the population. The innovators would be the people who are doing this on their property already, our six test sites. And, um, and we asked them, to what extent are you familiar with the following terms? everyone's familiar with stormwater and stormwater management and even green infrastructure. Um, not many people were in, uh, knew what disconnected impervious surface was, um, but you'll find out later that they, of course, are, are interested in what, what it is. Uh, they just hadn't heard that term, as you may not have before today. And we, we, did, we got a sense of how much they knew about um, 
the stormwater in general and, and, you know, some of the bad practices and what, what leads to pollution and some of the bad practices and what leads to uh, erosion and flooding. And uh, this, this is about, you know, the pollution issues. And there was some knowledge there. And, you know, there was less concern about what, what are considered perhaps more natural things, but um, there was some knowledge. Um, and the folks that we surveyed, uh, they, uh, by and large, were, were not experiencing a whole lot of flooding in their in their neighborhood but some were and um and and that matters too but a lot of these folks are upstream or uphill from the others um also in this survey uh in this sample uh the blue represents um zero to 25 percent uh impervious and the blue and the orange is zero to 50 percent impervious and so if we look at this about almost 75 percent or more 80 percent of the, the people have enough land on their property probably um, to be able to disconnect their downspout so it was also a good sample for uh, dis potential we also asked a bunch of open-ended question questions um, and what happens on your property after long periods of rain um, and some people did have water pooling up and and um, there were some neighbor issues water running off other neighbors properties uh, but by and large there was some knowledge of problems and what causes them and um and then we asked what what would you consider implementing on your property and uh and the the very top piece here is rock features and the second one is rain gardens and terraces and then rain barrels um those were all sort of high potential uh, that people are interested in those at the very bottom is disconnected impervious surface um, and and the blue line is I, I don't even know what this is which is um which is interesting because they 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 don't know what it is but if we look at the rain gardens in particular that would be an important part of the dis process and then we got to the barriers and benefits questions um and uh, just like in waterloo on ontario um cost and funding and technical knowledge were at the very top of the list and labor was also up there um for what gets in the way of people taking action on their own property to address stormwater there are also these other concerns that came out of uh right in answer um fear of making things worse if it, it feels complicated i don't really have the technical knowledge and when we asked another open-ended question what would be most helpful um, what kind of help and folks talked about technical help and design help and installation help and financial help and those were at the top of the list and then we asked what would motivate you to implement stormwater management more or less what what are the benefits and, and remember this is a perhaps a biased group they are early adopters and and so the top four responses here are all connected to environmental quality and they're, these are people who care about the environment um they're less concerned about stress relief um and they're less concerned and some are less concerned about harvesting water and even aesthetics and and um it's it's about the quality of the environment so all in all we got the lack of technical knowledge and a lack of, or the lack of confidence in one in one's knowledge their concerns about costs and labor there's an interest in DIS practices, even if they're unfamiliar with the jargon, and there's an interest in improving water and environmental quality for this group. We also asked who's responsible. I know we're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to I'm going to move quickly. We also asked who's responsible, who do they perceive as being responsible? Uh, and and it turns out that they, they saw city government and county government and businesses and their neighbors and themselves as being almost equally well, equal numbers of, of folks thought those to be um, responsible and um and so we we interpreted that as there's this sense of shared responsibility that we all have to play a part in this and and so there's this notion of cooperation we also asked a question about what's their perception about their neighbors that do and, and they thought their neighbors also just like them lack knowledge and they might need incentives and they might also need help cooperating um and also most of these folks want to attend workshops and get more information when we ask questions about what else would you want to do so the they want more knowledge but more knowledge doesn't necessarily need to more behavior um and so uh, the diffusion of innovation theory can be helpful in helping us think through well, what might we do instead and so we have these test sites that uh, the team has created and these test sites are helpful for diffusion of innovation because they're observable which is an important part of an for an innovation to diffuse through a neighborhood or through a, a population um 
they're they're not really trialable. They they probably are compatible because they're they're they have an aesthetic quality that is very nice and um, and they're not necessarily simple, but they're more simple than the highly engineered options. Um, there has to be a perceived relative cost, and that's where there's a really great challenge. And there has to be a perceived relative advantage. How is this compared to doing something else like what I do already? Um, but ultimately, uh, we can begin to use some insights here to influence the social norms and develop that new paradigm of human stormwater ecosystems. And so through various efforts, um, we've been trying to engage folks in, in, in seeing these differently. And um, students also have built on to the work that has been done to um, offer potential more information and also innovative strategies to engage marginalized communities, which we're compiling right now. Um, I'm just going to wrap up in a minute. Um, Allison Royer also interviewed people who lived ne nearby these, and she didn't get much participation, but um, some folks were noticing, but not a whole lot of folks were noticing, and this was early after the interventions went in. Um, we, we also um, are going to interview more deeply the property owners about their experience starting tomorrow, and we just completed a survey of larger Asheville region um, and actually yesterday was the last day to turn things in. I have results for that, um, but I'm not gonna share them now because we're out of time. Uh, but we've had 477 people respond. Uh, this was all electronic. We use SurveyMonkey. We use their lists in addition to our own lists and some of our networks lists um, to engage folks. Um, and we didn't get just early adopters this time. Um, there are some patterns. I'm not gonna go through this, um, but I'm, I'm gonna, um, but, but I will say stormwater issues shows up as uh, not as high as affordable housing, but it shows up. It's not usually in people's top three choices. Um, take action, actions that they would take uh, on their property. Um, rain barrels are at the top of the list. Tree plantings, rock features, and rain gardens are all right at the very top of the list. Bioswales, disconnected downspouts are at the lower end of the list. And that's partly because we, we didn't do a good job explaining what the disconnected downspout is. And I think we're out of time now. Um, so what I'm going to do is wrap up. I will say this, that we found the same barriers with this larger population as we did with uh, the smaller population in our target neighborhood. And so it's really kind of, it's just more food for thought and more actually more support for our findings, our, orig our original findings. Um, and so I'm going to summarize by saying that um, we can benefit from this community-based social marketing approach, and we can identify perceived barriers and benefits. Um, and it's it's helpful to look at the early adopters because they're they're folks who are going to be taking some of the first steps. So understanding what they do is important. Also, understanding the late adopters and how we might build that norm uh, is critical. So we have a little bit of both of those pieces. A lot of folks don't know what to do. They don't have the technical knowledge, and they, they're concerned about costs um, and uh, we can use the diffusion of innovation theory to help us um, steer that, and we're going to have to combine that with some, with some good pu public policy um, to help find ways to finance some of this work, because I think that at the end of the day, that might be the barrier that, um, that we can't overcome simply. So I'm going to stop there. I went over, but thank you. And now we can open it up for questions, or you can take a break. Are there questions from the group? I think, Kelly, are you collecting? Oh, here's here's a, a question. Yeah, I'm, I think it's in the chat. Do you want me to read it or can we read it out to you guys? Yeah, why don't you read it? That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> uh, have there been any conversations with local approving agencies to include these types of SCM and green infrastructure recommendations as part of proposed single family site plan reviews? Yeah, the answer is not yet, um, but we're hoping that will be the case. We'll, we'll be wrapping up in the next month or so our, our final research report, and then we hope to disseminate that and um, you know, it, it may be that the state will want to do more um, in-depth research before adopting it as a practice, but everything that we've discovered so far, I think, shows that it's very promising and, and could be part of the solution in the mountain region. Any 
And and this is not related to that question, but it kind of builds on this, a similar idea. I, I do think that I, I've heard from uh, some Land of Sky Regional Council folks, um, our COG, who are looking into the potential of developing um, uh, more um, technical guides that can help and build on the work that uh, Riverlink and Blue Earth are already doing in that area, um, but really responding to that need uh, that people have for the technical information to be able to, to take action. Other questions? Well, we went over that. That was my fault. Um, it, it was a take team, team effort, we all, <laughs> including me. Great job, though, Keith. Great job to you all. And um, and if there aren't any other questions, we come back. Uh, don't be late at 2 o'clock. And uh, we're going to have a, a, a great speaker from UNC uh, Wilmington talking about algae blooms, I think. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Um, and thank you, Keith, Renee, and Tim. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Our thank pleasure. you. Thanks. Thank you for um, staying for the disinformation. That's that's <laughs> what we're here to learn to do. <laughs> that was a good. Um... <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll share my email in the comments. Someone has asked Excellent. for our, for our contact info. I'll do, I'll do that too. Yeah.